Hello and welcome to today's edition of Route 664 Radio, or Route 664, excuse me, the uh, road to human kindness. And uh, I'm your host, Les Winston. I'm the national spokesperson for socialsecharity.org, which is a project of the Endow American Network Foundation. And I want to talk a little bit about social security and uh, how that concept is important to all of us, uh, for all of us to be able to use it and to uh, change the way things are happening in the country. Uh, we believe that social security can help to eliminate the national debt. Uh, it can um, do that by increasing the amount of money that's in the charitable sector, which is um, the place where we are getting our social services from and the place where it's most appropriate to get your social services from. So if we can increase the amount of charitable wealth in a community, we can endow entities, nonprofit organizations, and allow them to do their work without having to worry about fundraising. And the issue is how do you get all that money into the community? One of the ways to get it into the community is by using social security. And social security is another name for charitable remainder trusts pooled income funds, and charitable gift annuities. Those are three devices that are very similar in, in, in context to Social Security because they are social devices. They were permitted by the government. They're in law. And they create income for you to live on uh, today or later in life. They also carry with them some additional tax benefits um, in the sense that you can use them to do smart tax planning by eliminating capital gains tax or reducing income tax or even estate tax. So they're very powerful devices, these social security devices. Today in our country, what we see is the advisor community, uh, for the most part, has not really taken up the mantle of these devices and made them available to you, uh, the the, the middle-class public. Uh, they're, they're, they've been made available to the ultra-wealthy, but not to the middle class. And what we want you to understand as, as, a, as, a, um, as a viewer and as a listener is that you individually can do this whether you're ultra-wealthy or not. Uh, you can do this as a middle-class individual who wants to try and reduce their taxes as much as legally possible and who wants to increase income for later in life, as well as to uh, get uh, some benefits from a, from a gift that you're going to make to nonprofit organizations in the future. Now, that's what we call voluntary social security. And what I mean by voluntary, it's, it's up to you. If you want to use that, you can. And it's available to you right now. Uh, people just know how to you need to know how to uh, access the tools that are necessary and to how to use them to fit your situation. There are professional advisors in the country, professional philanthropic advisors who have the knowledge about how these tools can work in your individual financial situation. And that's what you need to need to know. You need to be able to go to your accountant and your accountant can help you in some ways by telling you what your tax burden is. And then you need to be able to go to a a professional philanthropic advisor and bring that person into the mix and then you individually you can you can do something to lower your taxes and you can do something to create more income and you can do this in addition to social social security which is mandatory uh and you can and you can put in as much as you want into social security you can use non-cash assets to put them into social security so there's a lot of additional planning features and additional planning benefits that you get when you work with a professional philanthropic advisor and your own advisory staff to make things work to the best of your financial capacity. And that's, uh, that's one of the benefits of voluntary social security. Now, voluntary social security is not going to be enough on its own to solve the problem of the national debt uh, or to solve the problem of replacing the national debt with endowment. There needs to be a mandatory social security. And one of the things that we're, we're suggesting, one of the things that we've promote, we're promoting as a, as a project of the Endow American Network Foundation is the creation of mandatory social security. Mandatory social security would come into play with 
the uh, young in the country in the sense that we have to start somewhere to make a transition. Voluntary Social Security can supplement Social Security, but mandatory, I think, will eventually replace uh, the majority of Social Security in the future for, for the, this coming generation. And how is that going to work? Well, the way that we suggest is that um, service to the country is something that's important for um, all young people to think about. Um, in fact, the Supreme Court, uh, one of the things that's prompting this discussion this morning, the Supreme Court is, uh, is asked to review men-only draft registration law. And uh, there was a, actually there was a letter to the editor this morning in the Miami Herald, and uh, the individual was talking about why women should be serving in the army or women should be available, should be uh, required to serve in the, in the armed forces. Um, and his, his thought process was um, that this is the right thing to do and that this is a fair thing to do. And if you go back, young men age 18 are required to register for the draft. They're, regist they're required to register with the Selective Service uh, System. And if they don't register, there's actually a $250,000 fine and up to five years in jail. Uh, or five years in prison. So, I mean, of course, they're not going to always, they're not going to enforce that as much as they do, as they should maybe. Uh, but uh, I don't know how many young people are actually aware of that, but they need to be aware of it. And that's young men. That, that doesn't apply to young women. And so what we're saying is we think it should apply to young women, to be fair. And to carry that one step further, I think it's a good thing for 18-year-olds to serve the country. And I don't say this about, oh, you know, it's not only about military service. It's about serving the country in other ways. I think that each young person, if you're 18 years old and you're listening to what I'm talking about right now, you, you may not know what you want to do. And um, one of the things that you would get from this mandatory service is uh, a period of time, a four-month year, four month period where you would be in a, in a training uh, mode where you would be um, trained disciplined, um, you know, you'd be uh, team, a teammate, you'd be working in, together with others, you'd uh, learn to how to handle guns, you'd learn to do things that are military style mo maneuvers. But the point is that that four month boot camp, as we would like to call it, is a way for you to uh, be on your own, independent, you're going to get paid by the by the uh, government to be able to, to be in service in that four month period. After that four month period, we suggest that you'd have an additional uh, period up to two years where you will have the opportunity to do a lot of different things. Um, you could go into the infrastructure, rebuilding the infrastructure of the country. You could go into the care service of how to care for others. You could go into the uh, environmental service. You can go into the air, uh, air force. You can go into the, into the um, space travel, whatever it is that you think or that you would like to at least explore. We don't know that you have the capacity to do that, but you can certainly find out while you're in that in that mix. And that's one of the things, one of the benefits that I think will come to 18-year-olds, to you as an 18-year-old, you would be able to find your best ability. You'd be able to find what you really like to do, what you want to do in the future. And those two years, this initial two years, should be a credit for those who want to go on to four years of college. And the thing is that the government would actually be paying for this. Uh, and I think it's a better way to pay for things as opposed to giving free, um, you know, free uh, college. I don't think that that's advantageous and that's not fair to the rest of the people in the country who don't go to college. Um, I think that, uh, that that could be replaced with this two year program. And so when we're, when we're talking about mandatory social, social charity, we would start that with 18 year olds and they would have a social security account as opposed to a social security account. I know that's a pretty big leap. And I know that uh, this is something that a lot of people are gonna say, oh my God, we're gonna have our kids go into the service. It depends on how you look at this and how it's presented, but I believe that this is a better way for our country to move forward so that we can create, not only voluntary, we already have created voluntary social security, but we can also create mandatory social security. And between the two of those, by the year 2050, we estimate that we would reduce the government's debt by about $28 trillion of what they are reporting as debt. Um, and we would do that by eliminating the government from 
providing funds for social services for uh, you know giving uh, the grants to charity uh, why the government would give grants to charity is uh, is is a little bit confusing the government gives you the right to make the grant yourself and it's deductible from your taxes but if the government's giving the grants to charity they're doing it after they're taking your tax dollars so it really doesn't make any sense and if we eliminate just that section of what the government is doing we would cut a lot of expense from the government over the long term and so by 2050 would have some some of this uh, we would have a lot of this in place almost completely done where we'd be endowing communities so they can have uh, free hospitals their educational system would be well supported the care system in general will be supported streets would be safer you're also going to generate when you have individuals in mandatory service uh, you're going to generate a better group of um, first responders even uh, more people will go into the into the services police officers or firefighters they will have more of their uh, skill sets uh, delineated also you'll have more people going into the trades who want to go into the trades or can who are not really going to college i think a lot of kids when they reach age 18 and they're not going to college they don't know what to do uh, so this is a way to, to help them and to help you um, the, you the listener here if you're um, if you want to support something, this is what we would like to think uh, is good for you to support. We're doing something else as well. <clears throat> In the um, Aventura Sunny Isles Beach Chamber of Commerce, we've created a uh, program called Chamber Teens. And Chamber Teens is a way for young people to get involved in their community through the Chamber of Commerce. And we actually have a division of that created. So if you're listening out there, if you're a teenager and uh, you're in the Aventura Sunny Isles Beach area, um, think about joining Chamber Teens. It's a really good way for you to help the community to get known by employers, to uh, get into the mix of what's going on in the community and to help serve uh, others. We're joined now by my good friend and guest, Les Haber. Les is, uh, Les is the jazz aficionado. And Les has uh, his own program called Just Jazz on Route 664 Radio. And uh, if you haven't tuned in to listen to it, you should. It is uh, just a remarkable selection of great music. And Les does a phenomenal job. It's one of the most listened to programs on our Route 664 Radio. Good morning, Les. Good morning. How you doing, Les? Good. Good. If you could speak up a little bit, um, okay. move closer to your mic. That's good. All right. So how are things doing? What do you, what is your, uh, you got weapons on your shirt. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, if you want to see it, it's weapons of mass percussion. <laughs> okay, great. It's the drumsticks. Good. Les, you're a drummer. You've, yeah. um, you've been a musician for a long time and you've played with some of the greats. Give us a, give us a, a good story. One of the best stories you have. Well, one of the best ones is, uh, working with a, pianist from Kingston, Jamaica, named Monty Alexander. And we were teens uh, and started at coffee houses for 25 bucks a night uh, and ended up at the Playboy Club at Chili's, uh, played for Sinatra, and uh, Sinatra fell in love with Monty and made him an icon today. Uh, Monty travels uh, I guess, except for uh, COVID, he spends about 46 weeks a year traveling all over the world. Uh, and still my favorite piano player ever, although I love Oscar Peterson. Uh, I miss Chick Corea. There, there's so many great musicians. And doing this radio show has really been enlightening for me because it's brought me back to a lot of my roots uh, uh -huh. going back to when I was, when I discovered jazz, I was about four or five years old. My brother was into it. He was seven and a half years older. He became a psychotherapist, but was one <laughs> heck of a great jazz pianist. Uh -huh. Really? Uh, and that my first gig was at age 11. He called me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing my homework or I'll get in trouble. And he said, no, you're not. Pack up your drums. I'm going to come pick you up. Uh, my drummer didn't show. That was great. Uh, so my you first mean, gig was at age 11. Not bad. Not bad. So you've been doing this a long time. So when you're when you're uh, selecting the what you're going to play, 
how much how much of it is i know that you've got a personal collection that's pretty significant um and how how do you how do you make that how do you make the choices you're making are you doing it in in some sort of a you know a storyline or give us an idea how you're working well it, it's it's really a combination of things uh and it's based on what really resonates with me uh it goes back to the early days of bebop uh latin uh and blues and those three mixed together are phenomenal and the history of American music is jazz is the original American music. Um, and there are a lot of pieces of the puzzle. And I go back to different things. One of the pieces that I played on one show was uh, a piece by Les McCann and Eddie Harris called Compared to What? Uh, it was <laughs> cut in the 80s and basically uh, and and uh, Les McCann did some voice on it, uh, some singing, uh, and it was about racism, uh, and it was about things that need to change, mm -hmm. uh, and it was a really cool piece, and it resonated with me, so I put it in the program, and I'm finding things that are almost forgotten that are just really phenomenal pieces of music by some great musicians, uh, and and there are a lot of kids that are getting into jazz, and it's really a wonderful thing to see because it's going to keep that music alive forever. That's what's important. Um, that's and we never we never want to see jazz die. I don't think it ever will because it's it's just too good. So if you were going to rank best jazz best jazz performers, top three best jazz performers in the opinion of Les Haber. I can't. <laughs> there are too many. Yeah. And, and we've just lost some great ones. Uh, Chick Corea just passed away. Aretha Franklin passed away. Uh, there And there's so many good ones still out there. Uh, so I you think, consider Aretha Franklin a jazz performer? Oh, absolutely. Not just a singer, but a phenomenal pianist. Really? Oh, yeah. So uh, I I don't think I've ever heard you know I, say again. There's a new movie coming out on Aretha. Is there really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, how about that? So that'll be uh, that'll be a, an education for everybody about Aretha's overall talent. Oh yeah, and they they've started doing documentaries on uh, some really great artists. There's a, a documentary out on Miles Davis. There's another one on Chet Baker, and it's really interesting to see the history of these people in music and some of the pitfalls and some of the things that they've gone through, but the music's always brought them back. And one of the things that I think is really important, and my mother drummed it into me when I was very young, she said, you must learn music. It's going to help you in school. You'll be better in math. You'll be better in science. And she was right. And did you, did she use the word drummed into you? Oh yeah. Or, <laughs> she as was a, a drummer. Woman. This this is a woman that played piano with the New York Philharmonic at Carnegie Hall at the age of 16 and because the European Jews that came to this country back in the day and I'm talking I think my grandfather on my mother's side was 1890 uh, she was offered a full ride to Juilliard but because the boys got everything and the women didn't she ended up at Woolworths uh, wow. as a sales lady. And that was really sad, but uh, I'm a fourth generation musician and I actually have a great grandson who I talked my daughter into getting him drum lessons when he was five. Now he's the age of 13. He is playing in the band in school. He's first chair snare drummer and he's better than the rest of them that are older. Uh, he got a vibraphone two years ago. He's playing that. Uh, I just sent him my grandfather's flute, uh, and I'm sure he'll be playing that. He's got his own band, and he sings. That's phenomenal. It is. Phenomenal. What's his and, name? And, <laughs> his name's Johnny. Johnny? Yeah. Last name? Haber? No, uh-uh. Uh, his last name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you got me stuck. His last name is Strong. Strong? Strong. Johnny Strong. Johnny Strong. Huh? You will hear about Johnny Strong in the future. 
Johnny Strong. What a great, what a great, what a great name. All right. I like that a lot. Les, so um, give us uh, the time, the times of your show. Well, it's on tonight at seven o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and it's on Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Okay. Uh, and do we podcast it? I don't know if we do any of that yet. Well, we have it on, I think we have it on YouTube or it's on live. It's on route664.org live. Right. So uh, if you're listening out there and you want to tune in to hear Les Haber's show, Just Jazz, you can tune in tonight at seven o'clock. Go to route664.org and uh, find the, the uh, link to the radio station there. Followed by Shambhala. And also followed by Shambhala. That's tonight? Yeah. Okay, Shambhala. The house and the jazz thought we thought that. All right. They blend pretty well together. Shambhala will be on after just jazz. Yeah. Uh, so you can hear uh, both tonight. Um, tune in, route664.org, and uh, listen to the what I think is one of the best radio stations in town, actually. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can hear a lot of varied music on there, and the selections are amazing by Wanda. But, of course, the jazz is really important tonight. Uh, Les, I want to uh, just... I know that you didn't want to give me the top three. Where does where does I I haven't heard you play Sinatra? Do you think he's a jazz artist or do you think he's just standards? No, I think he's a jazz artist. The man uh, could have written the Great American Songbook with everything that he did. Mm -hmm. He was a phenomenal man uh, and treated musicians like gold. Uh, just and I I I look at him as a jazz singer just as much as I'd look at Diana Krall as a jazz singer. The only thing he never really did, at least that I know of, was scat. Uh, and most of the really great... Scooby Dooby Doo. That was it. Scooby yeah. Dooby Doo. That was the biggest scat he ever did, I think. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that was probably the only scat he ever did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what about Ella? Ella was phenomenal, but so was Nancy Wilson. Uh, I could go on and on and on on female and male vocalists. You got a bunch of great ones out there. Some now, some that have passed. But who's great, great now? Is, give me, the, give me the best now. The best now. That's hard. Michael Who? Michael Bublé. Eh, yeah. He <laughs> <laughs> doesn't really do it for me. Yeah. Uh, I love Lou Rawls, uh, but he's not now. He passed. Uh, Al Jarreau was one of the best ever as far as scat singers go. Yeah. Uh, Have you played on my Jamal at all? Uh, not yet. Okay. And, and that's funny and, because he was a big influence on me in high school. Really? Oh yeah. How'd that happen? And, uh, I just heard him at a record store uh, in Coral Gables. And then about a year and a half later, I met him at the Hampton house. And I spent hours and hours and hours talking to him. He was absolutely brilliant and very, very different take on how he played the piano. That's like Oscar Peterson, I think, may have been one of the best ever pianists. Mm -hmm. uh, and Marty, Errol Gardner. Errol Gardner. Well, it's a different genre. Errol Gardner was really uh, beginnings of bebop. Really? Uh, and he was phenomenal. Uh, Errol Gardner was really great. Bud Powell. Uh, was the first bebop pianist that really blew me away. Uh, and these are all folks you can hear on Just Jazz. Absolutely. Tonight at 7 o'clock, if you're out there and you want to have a great um, evening of jazz music, tune in at 7 o'clock tonight on Route 664 Radio. Route664.org is where you can find it. And Les Haber is our guest, and he is the he's the entire okay. creator host and everything else about just jazz and the talented individual on his own talented musician. Thanks for joining us, Les. Oh, and, thanks for uh, having me. And you got to yeah. thank Wanda because she really puts it all together. She's something. Oh, else. Yeah. Wanda does a great job and, uh, and you do too. And uh, we certainly appreciate your working with uh, Rat 64 radio. Thanks thank again you, for joining us. Thank you. So this, um, this program is, uh, is an, a project of the Endow American Network Foundation and um, the radio show as well. Uh, the radio programs that uh, you'll hear are related to what we're doing. Uh, you'll hear interviews that I've done 
uh, with folks who are philanthropists, who are planners for philanthropists, uh, folks who are in the charitable world who need the philanthropy to help them do what they do best. And so uh, this is a really important uh, project that we've been working on for quite a while, and we'd like to have your support. If you can help us by making contributions, you can find a place to donate on socialsatcharity.org. If you go to the website, socialsatcharity.org. When you go to the website, you'll find quite a bit of information about social Charity, what it is, uh, what it does, um, how it works, uh, what how it's related in a lot of ways to Social Security. Uh, you also find the advisors in philanthropy there, you'll be able to research and find an advisor in philanthropy near you that you can work with that can help you uh, do this uh, professional philanthropic planning using those social charity devices, the uh, charitable remainder trust, charitable uh, gift annuities and pooled income funds are all really excellent tools, very powerful tools to help you eliminate tax in certain, in most situations that are, uh, that can be done. Um, you can, uh, really avoid as much tax as you possibly can by using these devices. And you can also create important income that you'll need for the future to uh, to be able to retire on. So these devices are very similar to Social, Social Security in that regard, and you need to consider using them. Once again, go to socialsecharity.org. The website can help you find a professional philanthropic advisor and give you a lot more information. Visit us on Facebook. Visit us on Facebook as well. Social to Charity on Facebook. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great week. Um, you know what? Yes, ma'am. I don't know how to get us out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so you, we, I'm going to keep talking because you can't get rid of me. So here we are once again on Route 664, the road to human kindness, and uh, we're now finding a way to end this program we're searching for a person that will help us do that. So in any case, um, I can talk to you a little bit more about voluntary social security, social charity, uh, the importance of it. Uh, the honorable learned hand said, uh, gave a very important ruling. He said, you're not duty bound to pay the most the law extracts in a very famous court case about taxes. So if you remember that, you know that you can plan to avoid taxes. And there are two, he also said there are two taxpayers in the country. One, there are two tax codes in the country, one for the informed and one for the uninformed. So if you want to be an informed taxpayer and use what the tax code gives you, you can find Route 664 to your advantage. If you listen to the program, you'll hear interviews about how this can be done. All right. I think we're ready to be closed out. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. And uh, a little bit elongated, but it's okay. I'm not waiting for anybody to come on after me. So. We'll see you next week. Take care.